Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I was just told an hour ago that uh, we're going to be taped here this afternoon. So I'm just glad I got a haircut over the weekend. And, uh, so especially my wife will be glad to see that. <laughs> so, so what I want to do is I want to talk about data assimilation techniques. And I call it 101 because I'm going to stay very, very basic. You know, I'm going to do, talk about some of the, of the um, techniques that have been used over the past 50 years, basically. You're going to, you're going to see that. And, but I stay at a very basic level. Tomoko will go in a little bit more detail with respect to some of these techniques. And I think Gary Bast and, uh, um, will talk in even more depth of it. So I will stay you know, very basic. I'm going to show you some simple examples. And uh, I'm not sure if you hear data assimilation techniques, how familiar you are with these techniques, if you've heard about them, if you've heard about the Kalman filter, also flaws or variational techniques. But I'm sure about that you're all very familiar with a result of a data assimilation model or a result of data assimilation models. And that's our daily weather forecast. The daily weather forecast that you see every day in the, on the news or in the newspaper, that's really a result of a data assimilation model. You know, there is a physics-based model. There are data behind this. And this is the result of this model. And of course, the meteorologists are doing this for a long, long time, as you're going to see, for more than 50 years. So why, why are we doing this? You know, What's behind all, all of this? Why are meteorologists doing data assimilation? And on the, on the one hand, if you look at over the past, let's say, decade, at least in the ionosphere, if I speak from that perspective, we've gained a large quantity of data. And that data can be in the form of ground-based data. For, think of, for example, of ground-based GPS data. It can be in the form of satellite data, in situ data, remote sensing data, lots of different kinds of instruments differing, measuring different quantities. And it's very often, when you look at these data, that it's you want to make sense of sense of it that it's like comparing apples and oranges. You know, you have ground based, you have satellite, you have remote, you have in situ, and all this makes it very, very difficult. The observations are typically in different places. You know, some are, like I said, in situ on a satellite, some are on the ground, and so forth. The observations have different cadence and they have different availability. You know, some are measured every hour, other others come in on, on second levels, and what do you make out of that? And observations have very often very different error, st stati error statistics. So that makes it very difficult, in general, to create a coherent picture out of all these observations. But you really would like to do that. You would like to utilize them all to gain the most information out of it. Now, on the other hand, on the other hand, we have very mature theoretical numerical models. And with that, I mean, for example, a numerical model of the ionosphere, numerical model of the thermosphere, or the radiation belts, or so forth. But if you look in detail, well, it said that these models contain our knowledge of the physics. Well, that's really you know, what we know about, uh, or the, the kind of physics that we can build into these models. Not all the physics that we know about a specific, uh, specific uh, region in the space environment is really embedded in these models. But whatever we can put in there, but if you look in detail, it turns out that there are many, for example, uncertain parameters in these physics-based models. And these uncertain parameters, they come in many different forms. For example, if we talk about the ionosphere, the O plus the O, the O plus to O collision frequency is highly unknown. It's unknown you know, within maybe a factor of 1.5 to 2. Large uncertainties with it, yet it's a very important parameter and affects the results very dramatically. Secondary electron production, highly unknown. Downward heat fluxes, chemical reaction rates, and very important also external forcing. Again, if you think of the ionosphere, you're getting forced by the magnetosphere. You have forcing coming from below. There is the thermosphere that you have to worry about. And uh, there are lots of uncertainties associated with this when you force, let's say, an ionospheric model with this. And there are lots of other things. So we have, on the one hand, we have the data. On the other hand, we have these models. And the goal or the objective of data assimilation now is to make sense of all of these, or in other words, to optimal, optimally combine the data and the model to create a coherent picture of our space environment. And what I mean with that, the coherent picture, if we bring in the model, well, the solution should, should satisfy the physical laws, and it should agree with the data, well, that is as good as possible within the error, bar, error bounds. 
The data have errors, the model have errors, and if you combine them, you wanna take those errors into consideration, and that's really paramount when you do data assimilation. You want to see it's all about errors, or not all about, but a lot about errors. And uh, that's the objective behind it. Now, of course, when you bring in data, when you have a model, and you have to have a technique to combine all these, there are many, many tasks associated with building a data assimilation model, and I just like to to name some of them. For example, you have to develop your physics-based model, your physical model. That's, for example, a model of the ionosphere or a model of the thermosphere. That by itself is an immense task, and uh, some people have spent their careers on doing that. You have to develop data assimilation algorithms, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more, of course. You have to come up with a data acquisition software. You, know, you have to bring in data. You have to bring in GPS data, satellite data, and so forth. And you have to data quality control them. Now, errors are important, and the quality of the data is a very important factor here. You have to build an executive system to take care of all of these, to time the entire system. And of course, you also want to make sure that you're doing things right, so you have to bring in some validation, and you have to come up with some validation software, some validation uh, programs that uh, also need to be developed. So there are lots of individual parts, individual uh, components to a data assimilation model some concerned with the model, and others, of course, concerned more with the data. Now, if we look back, did we in the ionosphere or in the space environment came up with all of these? No, of course not. Now, data assimilation has a long historical background, and it goes more than half a century back. In fact, it goes back to the 1950s, when the meteorologists started their numerical weather predictions, in the so in the mid-1950s, and of course, as well, those were their initial ad attempts at that time, and they've come a long way since then. You know, they've developed many of the techniques. Other techniques come from uh, control theory that they utilized. But over the last 50, 60 years, have, of course, they've come a long way. You know, we're doing forecasts 10 days, or, and uh, they're not that bad anymore. You know, and, uh, but that's, of course, because they're doing this for a long, long time. Now, metrologists are not the only ones that have done this for some time. Oceanographers also have uh, done data assimilation for a significant amount of time, and they started about 30 years ago. And 30 years ago, they started to look at the large scale, the mean properties of the oceans. And there were, of course, also uncertainties in their models. There were sparse data, and they had to come up with some idea on how to combine this. And this was about 30 years ago. They then shifted about 15 to 20, 20 years ago to more look at regional efforts, the Gulf Stream El Nino effects at the time. And uh, of course, the idea behind all these, also for the meteorologists and as well for the oceanographers, was to produce an operational upper ocean know and forecast scheme. So you wanted to forecast, come up in a sense with a weather forecast also for the oceans. But I also like to, like to say here that a data assimilation model is not just there for operations. There is a lot of science that can be done with this, and meteorologists have used it a lot for science. Oceanographers have done it a lot of science, and uh, I'm sure we're going to do it. So where, where are we standing? Well, in the space sciences, data assimilation, we're not going 50 years back, of course, with this, but we go roughly 20 years, or a little bit more than 20 years, really back with the initial attempt or the first use of data or something that falls under the category of data assimilation assimilation techniques, and that was the AMI technique, assimilative mapping of ionospheric electrodynamics, where magnetometer data, for example, or in situ uh, drift, uh, drift measurements were used to come up with a coherent picture of the high latitude electrodynamic environment. And that was, uh, in a sense, the first attempt to use a data assimilation technique to provide uh, enhanced information about uh, the space environment. Well, it took about another 10 years, so we're going now roughly 10, 15 years back, when we started to also use these techniques in the ionosphere. And the initial paper that was published was in, by Bruce Howe in 1998, who did an initial testing of a Kalman filter for ionospheric electron density reconstruction. And it's very interesting that Bruce Howe is not an ionospheric physicist, he's not a space scientist, he's an oceanographer. So he knew these techniques from oceanography, and he came up with the idea, well, maybe there is some merit here to also employ, employ these for, um, for the space environment. And he wrote this paper, very nice paper, by the way. I can only recommend you, to, um, if you want to, uh, to 
get some in-depth knowledge about the data assimilation. You know, this is a, it's a very fundamental paper. And about at the same time, a little later, there was a program uh, came to life, the Game pro Project, and the Game Project sent for, it was a, initially a MURI, a multi-university research initiative, and the goal of that was to build an ionospheric data assimilation model. Well, as a result of that, there was not just one data assimilation model came out of it. There were several that were developed, and some were developed at uh, JPL, USC, JPL, some were developed at Utah State University, and that started about 12 years ago, at the end of the 1990s. Roughly at the same time, also the IDA 4D model was, was developed, also a data assimilation model by, uh, by Gary Bust. Now, over the past 10 years, then, well, data assimilation was not only constrained to the ionosphere, the space environment, there were also models developed for the thermosphere by Cliff Minter and Tim fuller Robel, for example. There were models uh, developed for the radiation belts, and we're going to hear more about that this afternoon. And there were also initial attempts, more recently now, to even use data assimilation for the solar environment, for the solar corona. Very interesting. So we're really picking up the speed here. And of course, we are learning a lot from what has been done by the meteorologists. And after all, they have these 50, 60 years of experience. And what have we learned from them on a more overview uh, basis? You know, since they have done it for so long, well, we've, what they have found was that the most accurate specifications and forecast models are those that are based, that are assimilating measurements into a physics-based numerical model. So you want to have physics built in there. You want to have a physical model behind it, you know, not just some ad hoc things. And they also found that better predictions are obtained for the atmosphere, and I believe that's also the case for us, when the data are assimilated with a rigorous mathematical approach. So you do it in an objective fashion and not with some subjective fashion. Meteorologists, for example, initially started to do subjective analysis, and very soon they learned, well, that's not the way to go. You want to have a rigorous approach behind this, a rigorous mathematical approach behind it. So this is not some hand-waving voodoo that's been done here. There's some math behind it. There's some theory behind it, the whole uh, control theory, for example, that study these. And as a result of these, there's a whole zoo of data assimilation techniques that have developed over the, or that yeah, have been developed over the years. And I just like to name here the, the most prominent ones. The most prominent one are the variational techniques and the Kalman filter. And the variational techniques, there are really two of them, the 3D bar, three-dimensional bar, and then there is the 4D bar. In 4D bar, the time domain comes into the picture, and I come to that in a second. And then there is the, the class of the Kalman filters that are also very important, and we're using them a lot for for the ionosphere. Now, the underlying principle behind all of these data assimilation techniques is really very simple. You know, and it's called something, it's called the data assimilation cycle. And what you do in the data assimilation cycle is typically that you start from some best guess background. So again, let's think of the ionosphere, let's think of the electron density distribution throughout the ionosphere. So you come up with a best guess of what is your density field, the electron density distribution throughout the ionosphere? Well, and from starting from that, you make some short-term forecast. Now, and that short-term forecast, that's typically something 15 minutes, maybe 30 minutes. We're not talking here. You, you're not making a two-day forecast or a two-week forecast. Think of 15 minutes or 30 minutes, roughly. And at the same time, now, you gather da data. So you collect your data. And now in the data assimilation, what you do is now you build something that's called the analysis. And I come to more, more about uh, way, way, what this means here. By combining the quality controlled data with the short term, short term forecasts by minimizing something that's called a, a, a cost function to create the analysis. Now the analysis then, you feed back to this step here. You make a short term forecast, again 15 minutes forward in time now using this analysis that you have just created, that's analysis, that's your improved electron density distribution where the data have now were combined with the model output. Now, of course, I have to come to, to the technique in a second. But again, you make a short-term forecast, you collect your data, and you move forward in this cycle. Now, of course, you also can make a forecast, like 
for example, the weather people do, they do the weather forecast where they start off the analysis and then they run a physics-based model forward in time and that's your forecast that you do. So if we look in, in, 3D, in 3D VAR, you know, where you start from you know, is some best estimate of what, your, what the state is. So you start up with the best estimate of what your background is. Now that best estimate could come, for example, from an empirical model or it come, could come from a physics-based model. It does not necessarily have to come from a physics-based model. For example, Amy uses statistical patterns behind it. And Amy falls under this category 3D, 3D VAR objective analysis. And they, they're using um, empirical models as their best guess for the background. But very often one uses a physics-based model, an output from a physics-based model as your first estimate of the state. Okay, then you make your short-term forecast based on that, and now you combine the data with the short-term forecast by minimizing the differences between the analysis, that's what you want, that's your updated state vector here, your updated electron densities, by minimizing the differences between the analysis and a weighted combination of the data, the observations, and of your short-term forecast. So it's a weighted combination of these two. Well, where do the weights come from? Well, that's where the errors come into the pictures. That's where the errors in your background model, that's where errors in your data come into the picture. And mathematically, that this is done by something that's called a cost function. And you're going to minimize a so-called cost function. And the cost function consists of several parts. And if we look here, just written it down here, there's, for example, a cost associated with your background. Well, how much do you trust your background? How good is it going to be? There's a cost associated with your observations. Similar thing. How good is your data? How much do you trust your data? What are the errors in there? And there could be another cost associated with constraints. For example, you want to uh, con constrain some physical properties. For example, continuity equation or your solution. The analysis should, analysis should satisfy Maxwell's equations. And you could bring this also in through the cost functions. So this is where your physics would, uh, or one part point where physics would enter. But you have these, these different costs in here, and then you minimize this. So if we just look at this first cost function here associated with the background field, well, how does that look? Well, a very typical form of this cost function is that we have our analysis variable. So again, think of the electron density that we want to get after combining the model output with the, uh, with the data. Again, that's the analysis. You subtract from it well, what you think the, the ionosphere is right now, what your best guess of it is, what your background is, the difference between these two. You look at that difference. How much do I have to change my background you know, to come closer to or to, to get a better representation of the ionosphere? Well, this, this entire term here, well, it's weighted by something that's called the background error covariance. The, the background error covariance matrix. And the background error covariance matrix B that tells you how good is your background, you know? And it also tells you if I have an error in my background at some location, well, how does that relate to an error that I have at other locations? So for example, if I know the electron density here and I have some error associated with that, then is that error related to, let's say, an electron density 100 kilometers away from here. Are these errors correlated? And this information is embedded in this background error covariance matrix. Now you might already get a, get a feel for, we don't really know that too well. You know, these background error covariances, they're only very poorly known. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty in there, and if you go back to what meteorologists have done, you're going to find out that over the last 50 years they've spent a significant amount of that time to fiddle with these error background uh, covariance matrices. But they're very important in here. And to understand this a little bit now, now if you think, well, this is a cost function. And now let's, let's say the error covariance matrix that has the variances, that has the errors of, let's say, the, the electron density distribution uh, built in there. And let's, make it, let's just make the assumption that these errors are small. So our background is pretty good. Well, that means that B is small. Well, what we take here is the inverse of B. So if B is small, the inverse becomes large. 
So this one would be a large quantity if our background is good. Now, if our cost should be minimized, should, may, should become small, what that would mean is that this difference, the analysis, that's what we're after, minus our background field, that needs to become small to compensate for this. This one becomes large, so to compensate for this, this term has to become small. So the analysis is close to the background. And that makes perfect sense because we say, well, our background is pretty good, so we want to be close to that background. Now, on the other hand, now, if our background is not that good, if it has large errors, b becomes large, 1 over b becomes small, and in that term, in that case, these terms here, xa minus xb, can become larger. And you're allowed to go further away from your background, just as one would expect, uh, because you don't trust your background that much. And that's the basic idea behind this. But of course, uh, there's much more to it, and that has to do with these covariances that are correlated at different locations. So for example, if I have an error here, and now I reduce that error, because I make a measurement here, then that also tells me something that somewhere else, that error is also reduced. They're correlated to each other. So I know the ionosphere somewhere else also better because of this observation here. And that's also treated with these uh, the so-called off-diagonal elements in this, in this uh, matrix. And you're going to see that in an example in a second. Now, very similar with the cost function associated with the observations. Now, again, we have uh, error covariances in here. But this time, it's the observational error covariance. And this now goes in a very, very similar fashion. But the observational error covariance matrix tells you now, well, how good is your data? And again, if you trust your data more, then your analysis comes closer to your background. If you trust your data less, well, then you're allowed to go further away from that. And that's associated, is taken care of in these um, cost function associated with the observations. And then you, you can bring in the constraints, the physical constraints. But if we look where the physical properties or the physical models came into the, play, into the picture here in 3D bar. Well, you see that that's mostly to obtain the best possible background field. That's where we started off from. And maybe to constrain the analysis, the constraint, uh, the cost function associated with these constraints. But you're going to see, you see that the cost function and the constraints, well, they are not explicitly time dependent. You know, there is not really a model in these um, embedded. And also, a temporal model is not even necessarily required to do this. And again, if you look at Amy, Amy does not have a physical model built in its scheme. But it basically goes from one snapshot to the next snapshot to the next one. That's also possible with this. But of course, a more ideal way would be if you have a physical model going um, temporarily evolving in that case, the electrodynamics also. But that's not built in in Amy, and you don't necessarily need that. And I hope you've seen why, why that is. Now, in 4D bar, in 4D bar, now the temporal evolution comes into the picture. So the temporal dimension enters into the data assimilation. And 4D bar, you can basically look at by finding a close fit to the data that is consistent with the dynamical model over an extended period of time. That's what I've written here. Or if you look at it in another way, you have all these observations. And you're going to find the closest trajectory, closest model trajectory through this data. Yeah, so the model trajectory, that of course embeds, embeds uh, the physics. You want to get as close to the data as possible, well, within these errors. Now, again, they also play an important role here. But you're going to find that trajectory through the data. And again, how to do, how to do that is by writing down some cost function that you're going to minimize. And this time you see that in this cost function, the actual model, the physical model, so for example, an ionosphere model or a ring current model or a solar model, explicitly appears in the cost function. That was not the case in 3D bar. You know? And of course, also, we have, the, uh, we have data naturally coming in here. But you see M here, this depicts here that this is your physical model that enters, enters in here. OK, now of course you also have model error covariances in here. And you have the same problem here that they are often only very poorly known. And, uh, be, but this is the basics behind the 4D VAR system. So tempor the temporal evolution enters the data assimilation. 
Now, the last technique that I want to, uh, want to briefly touch upon is the Kalman filter. And in the Kalman filter, you also have the temporal model, the physics-based model, directly embedded in the, uh, in the data assimilation scheme. And you also have these error covariances, you know, the model error covariance, you have the data error, error covariance. But if you look at these two first equations in here, oh, I'm sorry, they tell you what's been done with the model, how the physics-based model has been utilized in the Kalman filter, and it's, it's, it's been utilized in two ways. And the first one here is, well, this is if you start from some, let's say, an ionospheric uh, 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 the density distribution, and now you want to make a forecast. What is it in 15 minutes? Well, you apply your model on the density field that it is right now, and you make a forecast. That's a typical thing, what you do with an ionosphere model. But at the same time here, you also utilize the model to propagate your errors forward in time. You know? So this density field comes with some error associated with it. Now let's say you have the density here, and it has an error. And now this density field would convect to here. But wouldn't you like to take those errors also with you and have these errors associated with the density field here now and not leave them behind where this came from? At the same time, if you have errors in your velocity with which you advect, well, then you also would like to take those into account as you go from here to here. And that's been done in the second equation here. And that makes the error covariances time dependent and they evolve with exactly the same physical model that your density field evolves with. with. And uh, so the evolution, the dynamical model in the Kalman filter enters twice in here. And it evolves the state vector to make the short-term forecast. That's just a typical ionosphere model would do that. But you also evolve the error covariances. And that's a very important part in here. And that's something one naturally really would like, like to do. And with that, the error covariances become time dependent and they evolve with the same physical model as the state. Now, unfortunately, this is also computationally the most expensive step when you do a Kalman filter. You know, there's a lot of computations involved in doing this. If you think of, if your state is, uh, maybe has 100,000 elements, then your state error covariance is, is a matrix of 100,000 elements by 100,000 elements. That's a lot of elements that have to be propagated forward in time. And uh, of course, that's computationally very, ex very expensive. But I'd like to show you a very simple example how this works. And the example that we're looking at is just, let's say we have a rocket or a stone or a baseball or whatever flying through space, launched from some initial location with some initial velocity. And now we're going to track the motion of these this rocket over time, maybe with some radar or so. And I'm going to, going to show you that by using the Kalman, te Kalman filter technique, well, you cannot only track the location, but you get much more information out of it, information about the velocity, information about the forces on it. So how does this work? Well, let's just start just with uh, Newton here. MD squared, D squared X, DT squared is M times the acceleration A. Very, very simple. Now we can write this second order uh, differential equation. We can write it as two first order equations. The x dt is the velocity, dv dt is a. So instead of having one second order, now we have two first order equations that we can discretize. And uh, what I've used here is, for example, just a very simple Euler scheme to discretize is that the position at the next time step, i plus one, is the one at the last time step plus the previous velocity times dt, and similar for the velocity, and for the acceleration, well, I just say, well, it doesn't evolve over time. I'm just uh, using persistence here. Now, if I now take x, v, and a, say, well, that's my state, then I can write this set of equations, can write it in, in matrix form, and say, well, my state at the next time step, that's just my model operating on the state at the last time step. So this is just my physics model going forward here. And if I write this down, I can write down M in this matrix form here is 1 and dt, 0, 0, 1, dt, 0, 0, 1. Operating on the state at the last time step to give me the state at the next time step. Very straightforward. So what do we now have to do in the Kalman filter? Well, we use this one as our first equation. But we also have to propagate our error covariances forward in time. 
So if we propagate the error covariance forward in time, we're using that same model. You know, we have m operating on the error covariance matrix at the last time step times m, m transposed. Now let's say we start at some point. At some point, we have an uncertainty in the, uh, in the position, certainty in the velocity, and an uncertainty in the acceleration. We don't really know this too well. So I write this here down as an uncertainty in the position, velocity, and the acceleration. These are the variances. And I don't have any cross terms here, yet they tell me if I have my position wrong, how wrong my velocity is, and so forth. These would end up as off-diagonal uh, uh, off elements in here. So now let's see, let's go through this equation here. So the next step, now I have to calculate P1. Well, it's my P0 and M and M transposed. Can just do some uh, yeah, matrix multiplication here. And what I end up with is, well, that now if I look at my diagonal elements here, diagonal elements, this one here was the uncertainty in the position. Well, that's my previous uncertainty in, in the position but it got inflated, and it got inflated by my uncertainty in the velocity. Well, that just makes sense. You know, if I move somewhere else, I have an uncertainty in my velocity, well, then that should also be reflected in an uncertainty in the position. And in the same way here, uncertainties in the velocity get inflated by uncertainties in the acceleration. But very important also here are that there are cross terms evolving here, which tell me, well, if I have an uncertainty in the position, then that is related to an uncertainty in the, in the uh, if I have an uncertainty in the velocity, then that is related to an uncertainty in the position. They are correlated to each other. Or in other words, if I would reduce my uncertainty in the position by maybe taking a measurement, then I could use that to reduce my uncertainty in the velocity too, by getting better to that. So how does this now work if I to show you here, now let's say we have here the position x and y of our rocket, now just initially here, and now we have the velocity in here in the x and y position and the acceleration in the x and y position here. And if I just would just start this here, you would see that the black one here, well, this is the outcome of the, uh, the Kalman filter, red are the observations here. You see that we are tracking the position very nicely, but at the same time, we're also getting information about the velocity out of it, and we're getting information about the acceleration out of it. Well, you would say, well, I could do this on a piece of paper. I don't need a Kalman filter for this. And true, you could do that. You know, that's, uh, uh, of course, for, for this simple example, that's possible, but if you think of a more complicated system, you can't do that. That simple, simply anymore. But the important thing here is, what I want to get out of this is that you're not just getting information about the position out of here, but that the forcing you know, is also specified based on the dynamics provided by the dynamical model in here. The dynamics comes here from just Newton's equation. And now if we go you know, to a much more complicated situation, if we go to the ionosphere, for example, well then of course we have much more complicated differential equations we maybe want to have a global reconstruction. We have many observations, you know, different kinds of measurements, measuring different quantities. Observations are at different places. And of course, then we are at the situation that we have in the ionosphere, but we're using the same basic techniques behind this, uh, where we get, where we take, for example, observations of the electron density, and we use it to not just reconstruct the electron density, but to also get information about the forcing forcing in the term, in terms, for example, of electric fields, of the neutral wind, and so forth, out of this. And, uh, but you might get a feel of how we can do this. Now, it turns out that, unfortunately, this propagation of the error covariance matrix, it's so computationally time consuming that you have to come up with uh, solutions around this, with limitations, and uh, I'd just like to, like to show you what, in the ionosphere, for example, we're using, there's a, again, a whole zoo now of approximations to the Kalman filter that have been developed. For example, the band-limited Kalman filter, the reduced-state Kalman filter, the Gauss-Markov Kalman filters, ensemble Kalman filters, and all of these are just to get around this immense computational effort that is needed to propagate this error covariance matrix forward in time. And I just picked these four in here because in some way or another, they're all em employed in ionospheric models um, that we're using uh, um, that are currently uh, 
currently in use, for example, the band limited Kalman filter is used by, by JPL, you see JPL and the other ones, the Gauss Markov Kalman filter. We have built one that's operational now and we're building ensemble Kalman filters now. So all of these techniques are, are employed in the ionosphere at the moment. And I'd like to just stop here.